Grab your Bible, turn to John chapter number 5, the Gospel of John chapter number 5. Pastor, thank you for the opportunity to preach this evening. Sure, look forward to it. been excited and been praying about what the Lord would give to us to preach. And I feel that we have a message that God would have us uh, to have uh, to preach this evening. So we're thankful for that. Again, thank you for the opportunity to preach. The Gospel of John chapter number 5. You know, as we, as we study the Gospel of John, um, he's, he's different than, the, than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the fact that uh, John kind of fills in some of the gaps, uh, some of the miracles that are recorded in John are not recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, some Bible commentators will say that possibly he wrote the Gospel of John some 50 years later. And it could have been that the Holy Spirit led upon him, obviously, to write this uh, so that we could see Christ in a different way. And as we understand through the Gospel of John, you kind of get the feeling that John kind of feels like he's Jesus' favorite, doesn't he? The way he talks about the Lord, uh, John the Beloved, he talks about that. And as, and as, we, as we open the Gospel of John, we, matter of fact, we, we see it in the, in the very first verse of, uh, of chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John is setting out to reveal Jesus Christ to humanity, and it's recorded in Scripture. We see this also carried on through uh, 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 chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, as it talks about the light of the world, and it's carried on through verse number 14 as well, where it says, and the Word, capital W, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And as John is revealing the, revealing, uh, the Lord to us, He's, in many ways, he's showing some, some unique miracles that we don't see other places. And these miracles, they, they're evidence of who Christ is. They're evidence that he is the Messiah. He's showing, he's revealing that Christ is who he says he is. Uh, so we see this, and, and we see a, a, a glimpse of ministry. I love this story in John chapter number five. It's amazing sometimes how, how people can make things look easy. And Jesus certainly makes ministry look easy. He makes it look effortless, the way he goes about it. It's almost intentional. Obviously, we, we believe it is intentional, the way he does it. Uh, I have a habit of when uh, things break, I'm, I'm cheap, and I don't want to pay someone to come fix it, and sometimes I end up paying more in the long run. That's another story. But uh, sometimes, I'll, if it's an appliance or uh, something with my vehicle, something minor, uh, I can go to YouTube, and I can uh, watch all kinds of videos. Uh, all kinds of experts, right? And uh, they're showing you how to do things. And one, one quick glance at it, and I think, I got it. Babe, I got this. Uh, heater element and a dryer, I can do this. Let's go. And uh, so I'll get started thinking, I've watched it now. I'm, I've, I'm an expert. I've, I've seen it. And many times, I, as a matter of fact, I don't think there's ever been a project where I've watched the video one time. Many times I have to go back to the video. I have to rewind it or go backwards. There's no rewinding. There's no tape there. I have to go backwards, I have to watch it. And then I have to pause it and take it to where I'm working and compare it and look. And they always make it look so easy. And, and listen, we, we get in Scripture, Christ shows us things that, that we can go back, we can flip back and watch it and compare it to our life. Amen. We, can, we can filter it through what, what Christ has shown us. And we see here today in the Gospel of John, we see here a wonderful story where in many ways you and I can just pause for a moment and just look and see what this Christianity thing is really all about. That we would have uh, the mind of Christ. Philippians chapter two, verse number five says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, we'll, we'll read the uh, first 15 verses here. Let's read, uh, begin reading verse number one. Our Father, we love you. Thank you, God, for the wonderful night you've given to us. Lord, help us now as we preach. Bless the uh, reading of your word. Uh, and Lord, do that work in our heart that only you can do, and you'll get all the glory and all the praise. Lord, we sure love you. Thank you so much for loving us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Bible says in verse number one, and after this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now at a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, 
Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and saith unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which made him whole. Tonight we're going to look at the title of the message is What Man Is That? We're going to look at three men. We see an impotent man who really has a desire just to be made whole. We see a religious man who has a, a great desire to be in control, and we see the Son of Man who has a desire to save your soul. Uh, look back at verse number one here. The Bible says, after this. After what? Well, and we won't take the time to read through it, uh, but Christ has begun his public ministry. In chapter one, uh, we find that he's calling some of his disciples, and in chapter two, we find the first miracle there at Cana, where he turned the water into wine. Uh, chapter three, we have the wonderful account the very personal account of Christ dealing with Nicodemus and telling him these, these, these famous words, ye must be born again. Amen. Look with me in chapter four. I want you to see this. In chapter four, we find out straight out of, out of, out of the, uh, the beginning of the chapter, he must needs go through Samaria. Again, he's very intentional about ministry, uh, very thoughtful about where he's going and why he's going there. But I want you to see this in uh, verse number 11. We notice in, um, in all, in all the, 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 the New Testament, as people refer to Jesus, he's called teacher, he's called master, he's called Lord, he's called Messiah, he's called Christ, he's called all these things. We find here in chapter four and five, three different accounts where people call Jesus sir. Nowhere else in the Bible. There's one place in chapter 21, we'll talk about that in a second. But these, these they, they stack right on top of each other. So what's the significance there? Well, the significance is there is, is in all three of these situations, they do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ as their Savior. They do not know him. They're not familiar with him the way a born-again believer would be familiar with Christ. In many ways, they call him sir. If you're walking in the store, someone drops a wallet, and you don't know the man's name, you might say, sir, sir, you dropped a wallet. I don't know his name. I'm going to call him sir. He's a stranger to me. I'm gonna to try to get his attention. We find three different accounts where, where the woman at the well, she calls him sir, many times actually, in verse number 11, she calls him sir. She, the woman saith to him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. Look at verse number 15. The woman saith to him, sir, give me this water. Verse number 19, she said, the woman saith to him, sir, I, I, I perceive thou art a prophet. Verse number 29, uh, uh, look at verse number 29. Come and see a man which told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? We saw a change, didn't we? She went from not knowing him and calling him sir to now she's calling him Christ. So we the, the, very, the very next miracle uh, is, is the, the, the healing of the nobleman's son. Look at verse number 49. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. We find this impotent man at the pool when Christ asks him, wilt thou be made whole? He says, sir. He, he has, remember, John is writing so that we might have a deeper relationship with Christ. If you're here today and you do not know Christ as your Savior, I, I, I can't tell you how excited we are that you're here. There's no greater place for you to be right now at this time to be under the preaching of God's word and to hear the truth of the gospel so that you might have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I think it's interesting, all three of these accounts. We find an, a fourth account in John chapter 20. Uh, you, you remember the story where Jesus is in the garden and Mary's come to him. In verse number 15, it said, Jesus saith unto her, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where uh, thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Clearly, she didn't recognize him. She wasn't expecting him. Sometimes, even as believers, uh, we, can, we can get sidetracked, and we can get distracted, and we cannot recognize the Lord. That's a whole other message, but I'm just saying there's, there's three points here, three different times. They're stacked right on top of each other. John is painstakingly working through the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the risen Lord, to reveal to us a, a Savior that's coming to, do, to die, uh, to live, to die, and to rise again. He's coming to reveal to us... He He's writing to reveal to us that Christ 
is the Messiah. Amen. So we look at verse number one here. It says, after this, after all these things, there was a feast of the Jews. I wanted to get on with the, with the, with the text, but I just couldn't get past this point. John's putting it in there for a reason. John's painting a picture. He's painting a picture to reveal the situation. A feast of, it says here, a feast of the Jews. Uh, so what feast is it? Well, some scholars will, might say, if you have a, a, a Schofield Bible, it may say Pentecost in there. I don't know how they would you know, look at that unless they found a calendar, kind of backed it up. So there, there's difference of opinions. It really doesn't matter what feast it is, but th- this, the feast, it could have been the, the feast of Passover. This is to commemorate the exodus from Egypt. It could have been the, the feast of Pentecost. This is to commemorate the giving of the law. It could have been the feast of the tabernacles. This is to commemorate the, the, uh, uh, the wilderness wandering. It could have been the Feast of Dedication. This is to commemorate the reconstruction of the temple. It could have been the Feast of Purim to, to commemorate the deliverance from Haman. But it's interesting when you, when you look at where these feasts came about and why they're there. Remember, John puts it there for a reason, so I, I think it, it'll do us well to just kind of hit on it and find out why it's there. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 14, G, uh, the Lord says this, three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me. A feast unto me. Our text says there was a feast of the Jews. Leviticus 23, 2 says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, pick a feast. Concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. So what's the significance? Well, John is revealing a, a backdrop. He's revealing a setting of what Christ is walking into. He's walking in, to Jerusalem at a time that should have been dedicated to the Lord. And he is the Messiah standing in front of them as they're, they're quote unquote celebrating their feast. And they've, they've, they, they've lost it. They've forgotten what the feasts were all about. And John chapter one again, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In the midst of Christ's earthly ministry, we see here a brief picture of three men. Three men. What man is that? First we see the impotent man. Notice, notice about the impotent man. He has an infirmity. We, we read this in the first, the first five verses. The Bible says in verse number three, there lay a great, interesting enough about verse number two, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this pool is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. That means house of mercy. House of mercy. Mercy is, is not getting what you deserve. Okay? It's not getting what you deserve. Um, you deserve punishment, but you get mercy. And Bethesda is, is in, 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 uh, translated, it means house of mercy. And here lay, lay a great multitude of impotent folk. This man, the impotent man, is included in this, in this group. Uh, we, we don't know what his, his disease is. We don't know what's causing him uh, to, to have this malady, to this sickness. We, we do know that he can't walk. Otherwise, he would have walked on himself. Matter of fact, we really don't even know much about this angel. Uh, some newer translations just eliminate that verse altogether because they really can't explain it. And I'll be honest with you, I can't explain it either. It says in verse number four, an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Was that an angel of the Lord? I don't know. It doesn't seem like that would be something that God would do to uh, stir water and kind of have a race and see who's the first one to make it in. It just doesn't seem like it. I, I really don't know. I really don't know what, what, what the deal is, but, but John says, hey, listen, for, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, uh, people are gathering around. Maybe, maybe they're, they're, they're doing, uh, just, just doing some kind of trick or maybe some kind of scam. Uh, maybe they've got people who are able-bodied and, and they pretend they're sick and they go into the water and they, oh, look, I made it. And maybe they're selling places. They're selling spots for the beds. We really don't know. We really don't know. But we know this, we know this, this man is there, he cannot walk, thus if he cannot walk, he cannot work. All he can do is wait. I, the Bible tells us he was, he was there for 38, he had this infirmity some 38 years. We're not told how old he is, we know he's an adult. It's very likely this happened, this began maybe as a child, as a young man. Like any tragedy that happens into your life, the family probably gathered together and they said, okay, we're gonna make it, we're gonna get through this together. And they probably said, okay, let's take shifts. I'll take care of him here. You take care of him there. You're going you're gonna to make sure he gets that. You'll make sure he takes this time. And, and all of a sudden, time just kind of goes along. And it becomes more and more of a burden. And he's probably a young man when it happened. And then, and then finally they just say, you know what? We, we have to go to work. We, we, I don't know that we can continue to do this anymore. 
You're kind of on your own here. Maybe someone will show pity on you. Maybe, maybe someone will, will help you out. Uh, you know, there's, there, there's, there's, there's a story going around. Some, some Bible commentators think this, is, this pool uh, has, has some pagan ties, uh, possibly some, a, a demon stirs the water. Uh, some, some commentators think that it's just a, a natural spring. There's, there's hot air coming up through the pool, and that's what's troubling it, and people are so desperate. They're so desperate, looking for some kind of help, that they just believe that that's gonna make it. Because why else would, the, they couldn't understand. Why else would water be troubled like that? We really don't know all this, but we do know. We do know the man can't walk, he can't work. All he's doing is just sitting there and waiting. This has to be a miserable sight. This has to be a place, probably when people and families would come into Jerusalem, they probably didn't want to go by that place because of just the looks. Maybe the sounds, maybe the smell. We just, we'll just avoid that, the, 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 the pool of Bethesda, just avoid it altogether. Maybe they, they hide their children's eyes. We, we, we don't want to mess with that. It's too, it's too messy. It's too dirty. It's dangerous. It's disease-ridden. We, and, and, and some believed it was tied to, tied to paganism. All kinds of reasons to avoid this altogether. But we find Christ going right to the middle of it. We find Christ going right to the middle. He's very intentional. So we, when, in regards to this impotent man, we understand he has an infirmity. We do recognize he's an Israelite. Otherwise, the Pharisees wouldn't have called him on the carpet. They wouldn't have said to him, hey, you can't carry your bed. I just wonder. Uh, turn your, uh, hold your spot there, in John. Turn to Isaiah 35. This is interesting. Isaiah uh, chapter 35. As an Israelite, uh, no doubt, possibly, he might have heard this uh, prophecy uh, from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah verse 35 and verse number uh, 5 and verse number 6. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. That's not him. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Well, that's not him. Then shall the lame man leap as in heart. Well, that's him. I wonder if maybe he had that scribbled out on a piece of paper, and every day he'd hold on to that, hoping, hoping that someday this prophecy would come true. We really don't know. Look at uh, verse number 10. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Maybe it's possible that he hung on to that scripture for those 38 years, hoping that sometime, maybe, maybe this will come true. We don't know this. He could have heard the prophecy from Zechariah. Look at Luke chapter number one. In Luke chapter number one, an earlier prophecy uh, from the father of John the Baptist, of Luke chapter number one. Look with me in verse number 67. And his father Zacharias is filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Now he's, he's talking present tense. He hath raised up and horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of the ho- his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the, ha- the, the hand of all that hate us, to perform mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember the holy, his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of sins, through the tender mercy of God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet unto the peace, into, into, the, way of, uh, into the way of peace. It's possible that he heard the prophecy of Zechariah that the time has come. And so he's there at the house of mercy. He just wants to be made a whole. And this is evidenced by his answer when he tells Christ, I have no man to put me in. But it's also evidenced by his action. As soon as Christ says, rise and take up thy bed and walk, the Bible says, immediately the man was made whole, and he did what? He took up his bed and he walked. So we find our impotent man. A couple of applications here from the impotent man. You and I, as believers today, if you're here today, you trusted Christ as your Savior, you and I, we, we were once like this man. We suffered from a sin problem by birth. We were born into this thing. And it was, uh, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. We suffered from a sin problem by birth, and we continued in sin by choice. And let's be honest, and many times we had a lot of fun. Sin is fun for a season, 
The Bible says that while you and I were having fun sinning, Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the midst of our sin, in the midst of our folly, in the midst of just living it up, Christ died for us. You and I were once like this man. If you trusted Christ as your Savior, something happened inside your heart, the Holy Spirit said this is true, you can trust it, you can believe it, you can call out, you can be saved, you can be made whole. You and I were once like this man. Second application we find from the, from the impotent man, what man is that? We find that uh, we pass hurting people every day. And many times we don't even notice them. Many times we don't even take the time to just simply hand them a gospel track. Hey, I want you to invite you to our church. You don't need to take Brother Jack's 15-week Bible doctrine class to do that. Here's a gospel track. Come visit our church. We pass hurting people. They're looking. Listen, they're looking in all the wrong places for mercy. They're looking in sex and drugs and alcohol. They're looking in entertainment. They're looking in all the wrong places. They just need someone to give them the truth. What man is that? Well, the first man is the impotent man. second man is the religious man. Notice this man, he loved the law and the traditions that were added there into it. He loved the law more than he loved the people to whom the law was for. As soon as they see this man, they don't, they don't rejoice that he, I mean, he's been there 38 years, no doubt. They knew him, they recognized him. As soon as they see this man, they immediately they condemn him for rolling up his bed. We don't know what it looked like. Maybe it's a, it's a bed roll and, and, a, and a sheet, I don't know. You know, he's not carrying a twin-size bed down the, down the stairs here. He's rolling, and just that simple action. And they said, oh, no, no, no. You've, you've broken the traditions. You've broken the law. Don't you know it's the Sabbath? They missed the miracle that happened right in front of them. The religious man, he, he loves the law. He loves the traditions that have been added to it more than he loves the people for whom the law was made. This, this is what Christ had to say to them in Matthew 23, verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy. He's at the house of mercy. How did you miss that? How did you miss to extend mercy to this man? You, 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 you've omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you have to done and not to leave the other undone. They missed the miracle. Look, uh, you're in John 5. Look in John chapter 11 real quick. John chapter 11, you recognize the, the miracle. Uh, Jesus uh, heals Lazarus. He brings him back from the dead. This amazing miracle that no one else has ever been able to do. I mean, how about that? We, we serve, we serve a, a God of, of wonderful miracles. After John chapter number 11, uh, look at, uh, uh, let's see here. Look at verse number 45. Listen to the reply. After the word gets out, that, that uh, Lazarus is alive. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Remember, these are the, these are the people, that the, the, the religious man who loves the law more than the people whom the law was given for. Look at verse number 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we for this man doeth many miracles? Forget rejoicing. Forget the sign that they should be looking. Is this the Messiah? No, no, no. This is their response. It, verse number 48. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. The religious man just wanted to have more control. He had a desire to be in control. This is evidenced by their answer, and look at verse number 10, when they, when they commend him, I'm sorry, when they condemn him, uh, it is the Sabbath day, it's not lawful for thee to carry thy bed, and it's also evidenced in their actions. In verse number 16, the, the Jews, uh, uh, therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. You see, our, our, our words and our actions will give us away every time. Just give it enough time. Our words and our actions will give it away. So we see the religious man, a couple of applications from the religious man, and we'll hurry on. First, we have to ask ourselves, have we become so enamored with our faith that our religion is more important than a relationship? Is, has it become more important to check the boxes and to look the part than to be sincere in truth in our faith? It's easy to look at the impotent man and say, oh yeah, lost, and then you get saved. Yeah, we know that. When we look at the religious man, it's easy. Oh yeah, they do that. 
But I think we have to do some internal viewing. We have to look at this and ask ourselves, are we so important about, are we so focused and motivated about doing ministry the quote unquote the right way that we forget they're hurting people all around us? That we forget uh, that we have the truth that we can go out. Are we blind, second application here, are we blind to the good things of God around us? Is it possible for God to work outside of our box that we tend to put him in? Oh, they, they can't get saved. I don't know if I believe that. Oh, they can't. No, that will never happen. We put God in the box. Are we looking for miracles around us every day? Are we looking for miracles, for someone to trust Christ? What man is that? First, we see the impotent man. Second, we saw the religious man. Thirdly here, and we'll finish up here, the son of man. Uh, Jesus is very intentional by reaching this man. Uh, Again, in John 4, verse number 4, it says he needs must go through Samaria. He sought out the woman at the well. Here we find, I, I, I don't know why Jesus didn't heal all the other people at this pool. We're not told in scripture. It very well could be that once word got out, these same people, they're at this pool, they probably sought out Jesus somewhere else. And maybe they got, they, they got healed. I really don't know. You, if, you're, if you're really concerned about it, you're gonna have to ask Christ when you get to heaven, hey, what happened to the rest of those people there? But Christ was intentional about this man uh, being, being saved, about this man being made whole. He'd been in that condition for a long time. He, he, Jesus knew his needs. Listen, he knows where you are tonight. He knows what you're going through tonight. He's acquainted with our grief. He said, well, Christ didn't have teenage children. I know that, but he's acquainted with our grief. He knows. Christ didn't have a a loved one who died of cancer. He knows. He knows. He knew exactly what this man needed. He knew all about his past. The Bible says in verse number 14, Jesus findeth him in the temple and saith unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more. Christ would have said that if this man was not guilty of sin in the past. Of course we know it, but he wanted him to know that Jesus knew. And he he goes on to say this, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Sometimes, sometimes sickness is a direct result of sin. We find this in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Through 28 through 30, as Paul's dealing with the Lord's Supper. We see it in James. Turn, turn to James chapter 5. We'll hurry. James chapter number 5. I want you to just see these verses here. Verse 13 through 16. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Amen. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Sometimes sickness is a direct result of, of sin. Uh, we're in John 5. Just real quick, look at John chapter 9. Many times... Sickness has nothing to do with sin at all. It's just so Christ can get the glory. John chapter nine, Jesus passed by, verse number one, saw a man which was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me, while is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. We think about the Son of Man. He has a desire to save souls. Luke 19.10 tells us as much. Uh, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Again, this was evidenced by Christ's uh, uh, answer to, uh, to, the, uh, 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 to the Jews here. Look at verse number 17. After they, they tell him they want to slay him. Jesus answered said to them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. He had a desire to save souls. It's evidenced by his answer. It's also evidenced by his action. Look at verse number 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. What man is that? I wonder tonight if, if sometimes we've missed it. Are we so caught up in doing ministry the right way that we've forgotten the outcasts and the hopeless people all around us they are looking for mercy in all the wrong places? And we, you and I, we have the answer. We have the truth that we can give to them. It might do us good tonight to just, just think for a moment where we would be without God had God not saved our soul. Where would our family be? 
Where, where, where would your, ch- your grown children be if you did not get saved and, and bring them up in a Christian home? Where would your grandchildren be today had Christ not made an impact in your life? What man or woman are you and I today? Listen, our answers and our actions give us away. I'm afraid that many of us have been made whole, we've been healed, but yet we're still sitting at the house of mercy. We haven't rolled up our bed and we've gotten taken off walking like the Lord told us to. If our story is written tonight, who would you identify with here tonight? Would you identify with the impotent man that still needs to be made whole? Would you identify with the religious man who just wants to be in control? Or would you identify with Christ, concerned about saving souls? Three things that we might pray about tonight. Lord, help me to see those around me that are desiring to be made whole as we think about that impotent man. As we think about the religious man. God, help me to see when the religious man rises up within me, the one that is more committed to religion than a relationship. God, forgive me. As you think about the Son of Man, this could be our prayer tonight. He's concerned about souls. God, help me to see souls like Jesus sees souls. Christ has modeled ministry for for us to follow. He's given us a pattern to follow, that we would go out to seek and save the lost, that we would go out and spread the gospel in in, in many ways, just just like a YouTube. We just back it up and watch it again. If we mess it up, don't worry. Just back it up and do it over. Well, I've never been a soul winner. I've never passed out tracks. That's okay. You got a good chance to get started. Let's pray. Go ahead and stand with us. We'll have a, a, a time of prayer. If you're here today, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, oh, can I tell you, we would not want you to rush out of here. I encourage you to come down, talk to one of our, 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 the men. Uh, talk to, we'd be glad to, be, uh, to open a Bible up, talk to one of our ladies. We'd be glad to take, take you through Scripture, how you can know for sure heaven could be your home. Maybe there's some things that have crept into your life that have slowed you down from, from obeying the Lord. Let's just give that over to the Lord tonight. Let's, let's ask ourselves, what kind of man, what kind of woman am I? Our Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for a midweek service where we can, in many ways, after the work week has started, we're somewhat tired and in the middle of the work week. We're thankful, God, that we can pause for a moment and get into the Scripture and allow Scripture to get into our heart. Lord, there's hurting people all around us. Father, I pray that you'd put such a burden in our heart. It would change our our actions. It would change our attitude and our speech to others. That we would see them as you see them. More that we would be intentional about reaching the lost in our world today. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in this place. Lord, if there's anyone here today that does not know you as their Savior, God, I pray you give them courage uh, to come forward, to talk to someone, and not leave this place with an unsettled heart about their eternal destination. We'll give you all the glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.